Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Jen with Slope Garden Center. Uh, happy Saturday. Welcome to our webinar on the secret season edible gardening with the one and only Pam Pierce. Uh, you all are in for a treat. She's a literal rock star in the gardening world. Um, and she's written the premier book on Golden Gate Edible Gardening, which is up on the screen right now. If you don't have a copy, uh, run out and get it if you're interested in edible gardening. And yes, Slope Garden Center does carry the book. Um, and I, I believe it's also available online and in other bookstores and whatnot. Um, we thought it would be fun to have our resident expert join us on this webinar as well. So Dan Alexander is here too, because I thought it would be fun for him to help me moderate the class. And also there he is, if you can see him. Um, and also just help because they're, they're the edible, like, you know, teachers basically for us. And so this is a lot of fun. Um, I do have a poll going on. If you could take a moment and pop over and fill out the poll, there is some information that we'd like to gather before the presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Like I said, Dan and I will be able to go through and filter them and answer them and uh, feed them to Pam. We aren't gonna take a ton of questions during her presentation. We're gonna reserve the majority of the questions towards the end of the presentation. So we anticipate this is a last about an hour. Um, you all should have received Pam's outline and handout in the reminder email that you would have received about an hour ago. Um, if you didn't receive that, let me know and I'm happy to send you the link. Uh, a couple of upcoming classes. So we're, we're closing out the year now, which is really insane. Um, time just keeps going faster and faster. But anyway, we have two classes to finish out the year. The next one is December 4th on um, Talanzia Care 101. And that's with Taylor. And Talanzias are those indoor plants that don't have any roots. And they're a lot of fun to put on wreaths and uh, mantles and whatnot. So that's a good class. And then I'm going to do the next one after that. And that's going to be the last class of the year. And I'm going to do uh, terrariums. So that's a lot of fun for the holidays, uh, whether it's a gift for yourself or a loved one. They're kind of like living ornaments. So join me then on, uh, that's December 11th at 10 a.m. And I am working on a bunch of fun classes for next year. So stay tuned. They will be on our website, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, weeks or so. Um, okay, let's look really quick at the poll results. 67% um, have attended a webinar before and 30%, so that leaves 33% have not. So welcome everyone. Um, have you heard of the book Golden Gate Gardening before? 62% have their own copy. That's awesome. That's super awesome. 22% um, no, can't wait to get my own copy. So there we go. Mm -hmm. um, if you've heard about Golden Gate Gardening before, how did you hear about it? Most people from a friend or online. Mm -hmm. And let me see. Polls are always really hard to look up for some reason. Uh, where are you located? So 56% are San Francisco mm -hmm. and 15% Contra Costa, 15 per, or 18% Marin. Um, okay, what interests you most about edible gardening? Uh, 59%, 60% said growing their own food. Um, and then the majority of people want to know about food, seasons, when to harvest, what you can grow for your own favorite recipes and whatnot. So 
All right, that's a lot of fun. You all signed up for the right class. Um, you were in for a treat. Thank you, Pam, so much. I really look forward to everything that you share. I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's um, good morning to, to gardeners. It's such a joy to be able to spend some time talking about the pleasures of gardens here on a Saturday morning. And if you have done that last summer, and if you do it in the summer, you will um, know how much fun it can be and you will look forward to trying to do that year round, which I'm sure some of you do. And before I start, I just wanted to mention Golden Gate Gardening and Jen mentioned it for me. It's there, it's at, it's at Slope Nursery and Slope Garden Center and it's also available widely um, locally in bookstores and nurseries. So you should be able to find it easily. Um, I also wanted to tell you that I write a column monthly for the um, San Francisco Chronicle. On It, it appears in the um, section called Food Plus Wine on Sundays once a month. And it, that I have also, you can find those, you can find what I write for the Chronicle by going to sfgate, G-A-T-E, sfgate.com and looking for my name, which you have to spell correctly whenever you're, especially when you're online, because it won't work if you spell it with the I before the E, it's the E before the I. And also I have a website, which is pampierce.com, and there's a link on there to my blog. And on my blog are photographs, which we decided not to put in the book, but there's many photographs, which you'll see today and slides and also in that um, blog and there's recipes that are illustrated. There's pictures of pests and pest management um, methods and all kinds of interesting things there. So this information that I just gave you is at the bottom of this back, the second page of the handout I gave you, but I just wanted to, to um, mention it. So I garden in San Francisco in a foggy neighborhood and I also garden in a community garden, which is in the Mission District. It's a slightly warmer and sunnier um, part of San Francisco. But I grew up in Indiana and in Indiana, winter is not a time for gardening. In fact, there's no flowers anywhere except in a florist shop. But when I came to California, I found that there was a climbing rose, a pink rose that had climbed three stories to the back porch on the third story of our house and it was the house that I lived up. I lived in the third story and it was blooming its head off in December and kept on going. So I knew that you could grow things in the winter, but I didn't know yet what and how. So I spent a lot of time learning that and Golden Gate Gardening is one of the biggest results of that experiment experience. So I'm telling you that um, what I learned in Golden Gate Gardening and I've added to it since I originally published it so that it now has two inland um, planting calendars. There's the uh, ones for the foggiest and somewhat less foggy regions near the coast, which are on page 18 to 21. And then on page 388 to 389, there are two more calendars, one for um, Contra Costa County, one for Santa Clara County. And, um, even with all of that, you will not have a perfect calendar for your location and you will have to do a little experimentation, but that gets you onto the right page for, for going wherever you are. So at the heart of a plan for year round food gardening is my division of the year into four different planting seasons. And that's on page 25 of Golden Gate Gardening. So the, the, the one that everyone knows about is April and May and sometimes June, which is typical of cold winter places. The, the second one is July, August, and sometimes September. Um, especially near the coast, you wanna be putting in your fall crops pretty early because the weather is going to be cool. And then October, November, just ending now, not much to do in December. And then the fourth one is the one we're going to focus on today, which is the secret season, which is February and March and sometimes January. And I call it the secret season because it's the one that most people miss. They don't, they're not aware that you can be growing a lot of crops at, at that time of year. And so we're also fast approaching that season. So we're gonna talk about how to use it, what to grow, 
when to start it, how to deal with the challenges that that season presents so that you can be growing food and enjoying its many rewards. So in a few minutes, I'm going to put on a slideshow that will tell you those things. But before I do it, I want to tell you several advantages of using that season. And the first one is, of course, that you're going to have food to harvest when there isn't otherwise food to harvest. So there are some things that you will plant in the fall that will, or, or the previous year, that will give you a, a harvest in that early spring, late winter, early spring, and late spring period. But if you plant things in the secret season, you will have a lot more to eat before you, when you're, and you'll be harvesting those things when your summer crops are still very small. So it closes what the gap of having plenty to, plenty to cook. The second advantage that is that you will be growing crops during the sec that secret season that need little or no supplemental water. Um, yeah, rains can fail. Dry spells are still possible, but you will probably be watering very little, partly because the cooler days and the um, shorter days and the advent, advent of more shade means that the soil and the plants will dry out more slowly. Third, many pests that plague our crops in the warmer months are dormant during the winter. They, they go into dormancy in um, October, hopefully, if the climate remains cool enough, and they stay in dormancy until the, near the end of March. Things like uh, leaf miners that plague our beets and chard, the um, root maggots of onions, carrots, and um, cabbage plants, the cabbage worms, the earwigs, they're all dormant during the winter time. And finally, the crops that thrive in this season are particularly crisp and delicious and tender during that period. So it's a lovely time to be eating them and growing them. Um, I wanted to point out just before I show the slideshow that many gardeners say, how can I plant anything in the fall? How can I plant anything in February, excuse me, in, in um, July, August, and September? Because at that time, my garden is completely full. The, the tomatoes are still just going, just getting going on ripening, and everything is, is very busy in the garden at that time. And I tell them that the way that you can do that, the way that you can be planting in that season, is to plant in the secret season. Because if you plant things in the secret season, in February, March, sometimes January, you will have them out of the garden by July, and you will be ready to um, plant new crops in those areas in July, August, and September, October. Put your garlic, place to put your garlic in, someplace that something came out that you planted during the secret season. So it's a part of a whole year fabric and it really works well to have a, to help you develop a, a year round planting. So let's look at some of the best crops for the season, how to grow them. And before you do that, be, before I do that, I just wanted to be sure you, you see your handout if you've got it printed out because um, it's, it's going to help you follow along if you have that handout. It gives you um, planting times for a lot of secret season crops, often in December, right around the holidays is when you start sticking seed in the ground. There are very um, detailed directions for starting things from seed in Golden Gate Gardening. I'll just hit some highlights and show you some pictures today. But um, you, and also you can buy seedlings of many of these crops, um, Slope Nursery and other um, garden centers will have them and you, but, but, but it's also fun to start them from seed. So here is my neighbor's garden and it is, um, hmm, there you go. My neighbor's garden is, um, they're Asian and they're growing lots of greens, lots of bok choy and they're also growing snow peas. You can see some purple flowers on those peas. So they, this is, this is um, February probably. So they, they garden all winter long. And I grow peas in the winter also. I, I can, snow peas are fine, but I really like snap peas because each plant will bear a greater weight of crop because you eat both the pod and the pea. And I always let mine get a little bigger than the ones that you buy in the grocery. They're, they're pricey to buy. And the ones that you see in the, nurse, in the grocery store often are not very fat. The peas are the sweetest part. So you, I kind of let it, let them go for a little while longer and get a little bit fatter before I eat them. 
I grow fava beans, which I can grow in the secret season. And I um, eat the flowers, which are very elegantly black and white and also are beanie in flavor. And I take the, the, the beans and I um, eat them before the beans can form in the pods. That is, I eat the pods. I, I will sprinkle them with salt. I will roll them in olive oil and I will roast them at 450 degrees for 25 minutes until there's some brown spots on them and they're quite delicious. Lettuce is another good crop for the secret season. Early in the season, you may do best to plant these um, from transplants, although somewhat, and you can either buy or grow your own. They're really easy to grow. Um, later, you will be sowing in seeds in the garden. Um, read descriptions of the varieties that you purchase before you plant and make sure that they're able to hand handle cold weather. Um, also look for some of these um, new open pollinated varieties of lettuce and of other crops, but the lettuce, there's a lot of good open pollinated varieties now. Um, there, this one was developed by Frank Morton. Um, adaptive seed or wild garden seed are good sources of these kinds of plants. It's, it's a really, really good variety. It's able to handle cold, it's able to handle heat. He has a whole flashy series, flashy butter gem, I think is a, is a uh, romaine lettuce, but they're, they're really excellent. If you prefer a crisper lettuce, this one is a crisp head or Batavian. Spring is a good time to plant them and you can start them in the garden as soon as you can put anything in for your secret season. So February is, is almost always available for the planting of these crispy lettuces. And there's a number of romaine lettuces that are really good too, for cool weather. Mescaline is a really good choice for the secret season. This mes mescaline is a mixture of greens. It can be all lettuces, it can be all mild greens. It can, in, this one has some spicy greens in it. Um, if, if you look, there's, um, this is a, a little um, mustard called Mizuna. Some of these crops are really good individually, planted separately, but here they're in a, in a mescaline. And here is a tatsoi. Here's a, 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 red, a red lettuce, I mean, excuse me, a red mustard. There's some arugula in here. Um, tatsoi is one of the, is one of the um, soys, the Chinese greens that's least, least interesting to snails and slugs. So that makes it always a good one to have. But what you really do with um, mescaline is you plant the seeds really close together. It's really hard for a neat nick to do this, but you do, you don't put them in rows, you just sew them together. And then when they are a, maybe four inches high, you cut them about an inch from the ground. You should be able to repeat that process. Um, this is a um, mustard that's red. You can see that that's ruby streaks that's in there. And you should be able to repeat the process two or three times. There's ruby streaks mustard. Here's a red leaf mustard, a large one. There's a recipe in Golden Gate Gardening for turnip greens and noodles and tofu, which is marvelous with mustard greens also. It's quite delicious. And here's an open pollinated mustard. This is one of these newer open pollinated varieties. It has a little bit of variation in it. And there's um, Mizuna, which is a mild mustard. So ruby streaks and all these three are fairly spicy. Mizuna is fairly mild. And any of them can be used either in a salad or in small, if you, if you put it in a salad, tear your mustard into very small bits and don't use too much of it so you don't overwhelm it or you can cook it. Bright lights chard. Chard is a good winter season, winter season crop. Um, you can plant it in the fall. You can protect it against leaf miners until they go dormant and then take off your row cover and have it all winter. Or you can start it in the secret season, although you want to start it pretty early because it will flower. We'll see that later in, in, Mar in um, March if it's, if it's too mature when it... So you want to have such a chance to harvest from it. Here I've used it as a color uh, in a winter salad when there's no tomatoes. You put the red stems of chard in it. I put some purple uh, cabbage in it that I had. I put a speckled lettuce, some 
some um, fly sheet butter oak in it, some red lettuce. So you can see you can get a fair amount of color out of a winter salad without having tomatoes to put in it. Kale is a great crop for planting. And look at your handout and follow along and you can see um, when to start it indoors and then how many weeks later you, you can plant seedlings out. Here's a couple of different kinds of kale. Um, the, the coal crops are all in the same species. You can plant any of them in the secret season, uh, except Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts should not be planted until after the longest day of the year. But you can take a look at this and see how similar the seedlings look. You, with practice, you can start to tell them apart. You can see these little wings on the bottom of the leaves of the broccoli plant and see the way that the um, cauliflower leaves curl and see the broad round leaves of cabbage and the long stems and little round leaves of Brussels sprouts, but they're pretty much very similar plants, including collards, which is very much like kale, except that it's not, it's broader, broader leaves. And um, it doesn't have to be overcooked. It can be just, there's a recipe in Golden Gate Gardening for couve monera, which is a Brazilian preparation in which you roll them and slice them really, really thin and, and saute them very briefly. And people will say, that's collards? And yeah, that's collards. And it's really, it can be quite interesting. Another um, crop for this season, you can set out plants of early cabbages. Don't go for the late cabbages, the overwintering ones in this season. Go for the short season, the early ones. There's a little red cabbage. Some of the newer cabbages make smaller heads, which can be good if you have a small family because what are you gonna do with a 15 pound head of cabbage, I ask you. And you can plant them very close together it's because they do have this very large ring of leaves around them that um, takes up a fair amount of space on the larger cabbages. And broccoli is a good, um, a good crop for the secret season. Um, and it goes on and on. You can cut the central head out and then continue to cut the side heads um, the, as you go along. Instructions are in Golden Gate Gardening for doing that. Choose early cauliflowers for this time of year. Here's a very popular variety, Snow Crown. And it, you can plant these out in, in um, February. The, the one the one um, coal crop that's the hardiest is probably cabbage. Maybe, maybe kale and, um, and collards are right up there with it. But um, so they might, in a, in a particular neighborhood where you can plant something in January, it might be those things. These are potatoes and potatoes, traditionally we plant them in, we think of planting them in March on March, um, 17th because it makes us think of Ireland, but in truth in our climate, which is much milder than that of Ireland, which is more like Oregon, we can be planting uh, potatoes most likely in, in um, February, mid-February. These were planted in mid-February. I dug a trench eight inches deep. I put the potatoes four inches under the bottom and then I filled in when it grew, I filled in that trench covering some of the leaves. And now here they are in March growing heartily and they'll be out um, in, in April or May. They'll be out in May, May or June. So you'll have um, an early crop. And you can see I put a few lettuce plants right in the front there. Um, onions, um, you can plant in the, um, Secret season. February is a really good bet for planting either seeds or sets of or, or um, seedlings, whatever you wish. You can gain a little by planting seedlings or sets. Um, in areas with the coldest winter microclimates, fall plantings will work, but near the coast, you don't want the onions to get that big over winter, and you can read about that in, in Golden Gate Gardening. So in either case, you grow the onions into spring and produce bulbs by late June. And when you can, um, when you find that the stem near the bulb is flattened, that means that the crop is almost ready to harvest and store. And you can knock over the tops, and it will finish maturing. And so that's what's happening here. 
um, many crops that grow in, um, go into a local garden in January through March can be started from seed indoors in December. And there are detailed instructions in Golden Gate Gardening. But here are some images and tips. The seeds for most of these crops start to grow better in warm soil. So you can um, put them in a container, little cell, cells that are at least two inches deep and have um, inch and a half to two inches deep. And you can put them on heat if you don't have a warm enough place. This is a very inexpensive seed mat. Um, I did not buy a thermostat with it. I just set the, the flats on it, plug it in and they're up in no time. They're up as fast as they will be. Um, move these containers to bright light as soon as you see the tiniest little pale shoot. One of them, one shoot. That's it, all it takes. And you not need to, you have to check this every day because you need to get those off of that heat mat and into the very brightest light you can provide right away as soon as that happens. Or they will stretch, they will grow too tall and too spindly. They should be about as wide as they are tall, your seedlings, or wider. Um, everything except onions, which of course are never, never going to be broad because they send up a single leaf when they start. But these are six inches, these are right up against the window. And if you don't have a window that you can put them against, that's a south window, that's sun, these have been out there for a week or two. Uh, if you don't have that, then you need to get uh, a grow light, or you can just invest in a shop light with it, one white, one cool white, one warm white bulb, and keep your seedlings six inches from the light. Then they have to be hardened off. So you start by putting them outside in um, during the day in the shade and bringing them in at night for a couple of nights. And then you can kind of start to leave them out all night. Um, unless it's particularly cold or particularly windy, a really strong wind can take can wipe out some seedlings that you that you started indoors. So you want to be careful of that. And then eventually you move them into the kind of light that they're going to have when they grow, in, and they should be hardened off if they're in the right season in you know four or five days, and then they're ready to be transplanted to the garden. This is some some cabbage and some cauliflower, I believe, and some lettuce seedlings. So um, some seeds are better started directly in the garden and peas are one of those. So here are some peas that I've grown and I probably started them directly in the garden. When I sow pea seeds, I cover them with a row cover because the birds and the snails and slugs go for the seedlings. And I put up a trellis, even if it's um, a fairly sturdy trellis, even if it's Cascadia, which is only grows to about 30 inches high. And I look for powdery mildew resistant peas. Fava beans, again, that's another pot crop that I grow by planting the seed directly. They're such sturdy, sturdy seedlings, they, they, they can start outdoors and be fine. And some plants have to be started from seed drone, sown directly into the garden. Radishes, they're ready in about a month. You can often plant these little radishes as early as January. And they can't be really transplanted. Well, they can be, but if you do, you will, probably won't get a good radish root. So they have to be sown directly. Um, they're pretty easy. So practice with those. Carrots, beets, turnips, most root crops should be sown in place in the garden. Carrots take two weeks to come up. Um, but once you get them up, they're, they're, they grow really readily and they're a very good crop. They are not easy. They cannot be transplanted and make good roots. Um, I once, I once um, encountered some community gardeners transplanting carrots. And I said, you know, they're not, you can't transplant carrots. And they said, oh, yes, you can. Oh, they were right. They transplanted the carrots. They grew. They did not make good roots, I, I observed. They made very spindly little funny roots. They were transplanting on a day that was misty and cool and I thought, well, you know, they'll survive. And they did, they survived, but they did not make good roots. Beets um, are the only root crop that can sort of be transplanted. If you grow small seedlings, you can transplant them. Turnips, no, I would just start them in the ground. Parsnips, definitely start them in place. Um, a couple of crops that are um, perennial crops here that um, 
you can start in the secret season. This is chayote seedling. You want to go out and buy a couple of chayotes. They're squash. They grow 30 feet tall if you let them. Um, the picture here on the right shows a harvest and they're being harvested. They've grown 30 feet up a building and a fence on top of the building. And that man is standing on the roof of the building. And you can see he's, he's gathering them. We had to get a ladder. So you want to think about where they're going to climb when you get them and don't let them climb so far that you can't reach them. But choose two, maybe three from the grocery store. Don't start with spiny ones because you don't want spiny um, chayotes. You, you want the smooth skinned ones. They're easier on your fingers. Um, start them as you can see here in containers indoors and or in a sunny, in a very sunny place indoors. And by March, you should have seedlings like this, which you can plant out and you will be harvesting in them the following winter. Um, so they can be used in any way that you use squash. They're a little firmer than, than regular squash. They're really a nice crop. Um, I hope your neighbors like them because you will have quite a few of them. And that's the nature of the beast. This is Yakan or Bolivian sunroot. I wrote about both of these crops in Golden Gate Gardening. Um, Yakan is a um, South American plant. Um, it has these rhizomes, which are kind of like um, sun, um, sun roots. They're, they're um, Jerusalem artichokes. You can eat them, but the, the really nice thing to eat is these roots that, that hang on stems off of the rhizomes. And they're different sizes and shapes, as you can see. If you wash them up, they're a pale beige and inside they're bright white and they're really crispy and really sweet and really wonderful. So you'll wanna peel them with a potato peeler or something that takes a very thin peel and slice them up and you can cook them, but I eat them raw and I just dig them as I need them and um, enjoy them. These, this, this, is, this is being grown in a pot, in a very large pot. And you can do that and it's easier to harvest, but it's not going to make nearly the size of crop as you put it in the ground. You put it in the ground though, you have to dig it and it's, you have to be careful not to damage the roots and it's um, harder to do, but it's just so wonderful. And these are two more perennial crops. This is a, a, a capsicum baccatum. Both of these are from the same species. The, the ones that we grow in the garden mostly are capsicum annuum, but if you live where there's very little winter cold, these can probably take down to about 30 and they, um, they're mild. There's a, there's a flash of heat occasionally in them. You take out the seeds and the ribs, but mostly they're mild. I think hot weather brings out the heat and they are perennial. If you get them through the winter, they prune them back a little in the spring, you will find that they go on for several years. So, and they make kind of a tree-like plant. So worth looking for. If you like hot peppers, this is a perennial hot pepper. It's capsicum pubescens, known as the brocata pepper. There's a green one on the left. You can see the purple flower. And then there's a red one on the right that's matured. They are very hot. And um, if you are interested in peppers, you might find that uh, Redwood City Seed Company is a good company for you because they have quite a number of varieties, including different species of peppers. And, they're, and this is kind of a perennial bush. You have to prune it a little every year as you, as you do the, the cottons. There are two winter crops that are, that are wild, that are natives. And um, this is, excuse me, that are wild. And this one is a native. This is miner's lettuce, which, or Indian lettuce, which is a California native plant that you can buy seed of it. You can actually find seed of this plant or you can save your own. And it's a, it's a mild, very mild, delicious salad green. It's very definitely worth growing. Um, here's how to save your own. You can go out and find plants in April when they're about to form ripe seed. And you can spread them on a, take, take newspapers and spread several, spread several pieces open because the seeds jump a little when they pop out of the pods. And just leave your plants lying on the newspapers and the little seeds will jump out. They're shiny and black and dry them thoroughly. 
and store it and then plant it in October or November when the rains start. This plant is being affected by um, global warming by climate change. The, um, I used to have in early um, December, I would have plenty of leaves to make a salad to bring to a holiday potluck, but now here it is um, the end of November and they're just barely coming up and they will probably not be ready for harvest until of good sized leaves until um, late in December or into January. So they're definitely there. Pam, I think you froze. Hello. Uh, while Pam's connection is coming back, I do want to um, take a moment. A lot of people are asking if this is being recorded, and it is being recorded. And the recording will be available on Tuesday. Um, there is a link that I sent that I will send out with the follow up email from this class and that will uh, take you to the recording. It's on our website and it's under the learn tab and then gardening videos. And then I also, a lot of people were asking about the handout that Pam was referring to. So on the link that I sent you, there's the outline that's right there that you can see it. And then there's something that says webinar notes, crops, varieties, and timing for the secret season. That's the handout uh, that she's referring to. So I hope that helps clear up a couple questions and I hope she can find her way back uh, to, this, to the class. Oh, somebody shared the direct notes. Um, Okay, uh, Dan, do you have anything that you want to say just while we're waiting for Pam to come back? I know that I'm sure you're loving all this uh, edible gardening talk. I am, I am. Uh, yeah, she's wonderful. Uh, and, and I certainly want to repeat that uh, the book is the Bible for Bay Area vegetable gardening. Uh, and uh, there's a reference in her handout to uh, another wonderful cool weather gardening book, which is uh, Vegetable Gardening in the Northwest, which I think is a timber press book, one of my favorite um, garden publishers. And that's worth looking at as well. Uh, we, we did have a couple of questions. Um, one, one was whether, um, Batavian lettuce is the same as escarole, and, and the answer there is no. Batavian lettuces are a, a, a strain of cool weather lettuces. Um, escarole is uh, related to radicchio and punterelle, um, sort of the bitter, um, some of the bitter flavored um, greens. And uh, so they're a little different. Um, I also wanted to say something about um, the concept of open pollinated because Pam mentioned that with some of these lettuces and uh, the idea there is that that they are plants that are allowed to pollinate themselves so um, usually by insect pollination uh, in order to get the seeds for them. And uh, it, it means that it's kind of like having open source software in a way that anybody can uh, grow them up oh, your back. Oh, um, our power went off. Isn't that interesting? Oh, <laughs> so, wow. yes, here we go. Um, are, are you seeing my screen? Yep. All right, we can see you. We can't see your uh, PowerPoint. Oh, okay, I'll try again. I'm gonna try it. Um, I'm gonna share the screen. Oh dear. 
oh god <laughs> excuse me but this is frustrating well i've clicked on it and it's not sharing it oh there's share okay excellent okay so we're going to go back one all right now can you see it yes we can okay so as i assume everyone else can see it again my apologies our power went off i wondered what that little sound was that was our clock on our on our um, stove saying your power went off but it came back on again go figure wild onion allium triquetrum it's a weed but it's also quite delicious. Here it is on a cutting board. I use it in many recipes. It, it grows health, health, heartily in my garden during the secret season. It dies back in April. And at that point, you can collect the little um, bulblets, which are at the biggest about three quarters of an inch. And they're fairly near the surface. You can collect them and put them in one place and grow them through the years um, and harvest them in December th or January through April and um, enjoy this. Look for um, the plant that smells strongly of onion. Look for um, the triangular stem for the flowers and the strong ridge or keel on the backs of the leaves and the un undersides and uh, make sure you have the right plant. But if you can find these either in your garden or growing wild somewhere you can else, you can collect the bulbs in April and grow it in your garden. And it can go in a place that's in shade in the summer and like under a tree. And then in the winter, the tree loses its leaves and the plant thrives in the secret season. And yes, we do have cold in the winter. Um, but look at the backside of your handout and see that some of these plants are very hardy, um, cabbage to at least 10 degrees. And here's kale, which is frosted after several frosty nights in San Francisco. And here it is a week later, you can see that it springs right back. There's a few leaves lost, the red and the, and the white ones are not coming back, but the rest of it's fine and it's going to grow heartily into the secret season. So we, um, we underestimate the hardiness of our plants and that handout will show you some of that, some of the reason, some of the hardiness levels that are really truly available for these plants. You can cover plants, you don't have to do a hoop a hoop, you can just use this polyester row cover to um, cover plants during particularly frosty weather. But be aware that what we have is frost. We don't have freezes, so the soil isn't frozen. Plants respond to frozen soil like it was a drought because the water can't, there's no water that can come into the plants. But a frosty soil, there's, there's water in the soil still. Um, the next question, the next subject I'm gonna try to speed it up here is, um, is shade and you can have shade in the winter. Here, a lot of things um, need, a lot of crops need at least four unshaded hours, a lot of these winter crops. So carrots and beets and chard and um, lettuce and broccoli and cabbage and many of the crops that we can grow in the secret season would like at least four hours of, of sunlight to, to grow. And if they don't get it, things will happen. Here's carrots that I planted them in a place where the, the shadow gets longer and longer in the fall. And here it's come, become so long that the um, carrots went into shade and they'll hold in the garden all winter, but they, you can see what happened is that they um, did not fill out and they remain pale low, low on the roots. So that was a late, it was a, a summer planting, but it was planted too late and they went into shade. So the same thing, would happen if you planted in the secret season, they would just not develop well if they weren't, didn't get at least, at least a little bit of sunshine on sunny days. I mean, you can assume that some of them will not be sunny, but on sunny days, they need that sunlight. There are some things that do well in open shade. Open shade is when the shade comes from one side, like from a building that, or a fence, but in the rest of the time, the rest of the sky is clear so that they can be um, obtain light from the, from the sky. Mitsuba is a, uh, a Japanese form of celery or parsley, which requires shade. And chervil does well in open shade. Ch chervil is a little herb. That's not it, but it's this feathery leaf is chervil. Um, and there are a number of leafy things. 
um, parsley will do well in shade, arugula, and some of the edible flowers like calendula. So you can have that. You, you also will be dealing with the moisture level, which may be too much. And the way to find out, especially if you have clay soil, the way to find out, it's important to find out. And you can do that by digging, brushing off the surface of the soil, digging up a little soil, putting it in your hand, squeezing it tightly into a, into a fist and making it into a clod and then opening your hand and patting that clod. And if it will crumble easily, then your soil is not too wet. If it stays in a clod and it feels like it's got so much clay in it that it's going to be possible to make a pinch pot, you know, you make a hole in it and make a little pot from it, that's too wet. So you don't want to plant then. You want to wait for it to dry out a little. And I learned when I was teaching that you can dry soil faster because I had to have it wet. I had to have it dry to a certain degree for um, certain plantings in the, in the, um, on Saturdays when the class was held. You can put a tarp. So there's buckets under there in the middle, upside down buckets. And then there are bricks or stones around the edge. And I tarped it on days that it was raining. And I untarped it on days it was dry. And it dried much faster than it would have if I had not done that. So that was a big help. Um, there are some pests that are active in the winter. And one of, one of some of those pests are snails and slugs. So um, I recommend a nighttime hunt and I recommend a headlamp which gives you hand free um, hunting in the night and you can get out there and and um, remove them but you won't get all of them and there are also um, there are you might want to use some row cover uh, or slug slug and snail bait sluggo is really good because the the ingredient is not toxic to most creatures except um, the slugs and the snails it's iron phosphate, it's a fertilizer, but you may have rats in the winter, you may have raccoons, you may have birds, bird damage. You can buy a lot of small cages to put over individual plants or small plantings, or you just might get frustrated and build one of these larger frames. This one is designed for the Garden for the Environment on 7th and Lawton. It has two ways to, you can open, see the first panel and you can reach in under it, but you can also put this up and it'll stand up on top and you can get completely, one side completely open to work in the bed. And that's very smart and will keep your plants safe. It's better than, than, than worrying about it, you know. Um, I made a slide just to say this because the next topic on your handout is about biennials and they will bloom usually by March if they have come through the winter and many of our um, common garden crops are biennials. I've given you the handout because I think you'll want to reread this when I'm finished so that you can follow what I said. This is an overwintering broccoli. It, it was planted in late summer. It came through the winter and it's blooming. And that's what those are, flower buds. And that's what we want broccoli to do because we want to eat it. However, we do not want cabbage to, bro to bloom. This is an overwintering cabbage. So you won't have this problem the first year when you plant in the secret season. But if you have any overwintered crops um, from last year, they are going to bloom if they're a biennial. And that's not what you want because that does not, that's a cabbage plant blooming. Very few people ever see that. It's about three or four feet high and it is not particularly delicious. Leeks will bloom. And in, in this usually happens in late March. Chard will bloom. We call it bolting, um, forming a flower looks kind of attractive at this stage, but later on it's not going to look attractive and there's going to be very little left for you to eat. So you don't, you want to eat it before that happens. And carrot um, has here is blooming in late spring from overwintered carrots. There are two um, silver linings to the uh, fact that biennials will bloom. Collards and cabbage shoots are delicious. If you cut your cabbage, um, rather than take the whole plant out, just cut it, it'll form shoots underneath where the head was and the collards will always form shoots in the joints of the leaves. And you can pick them over and you can use them like broccoli rob or use them like gailan, like Chinese broccoli. That's what's happening here. The skillet has um, um, collard tips in it. I call them collard tips. They're 
they have flower buds on them and I've treated them with, um, with uh, I'm, I'm, I've fried, sauteed, I pre-boiled pre them, parboiled them, put them in the skillet, sauteed them, put oyster sauce on them, got, add a little garlic and ginger, very good. Um, it is also true that the crops that are blooming in the secret season from last year are attracting beneficial creatures. So not, not the chard, it's wind pollinated, but everything else will, will is, is insect pollinated and it will attract insects. And here is attracted lady beetles, which will eat your early season aphids for you. And there's an, uh, a lady beetle larva there so that to help you identify it just about the same size as the lady beetle, but it's, it's something that you wanna be able to recognize. And finally, I wanted to talk briefly about containers, container gardening. Um, in all seasons, you wanna choose the appropriate depth for different crops. So you don't wanna waste your, um, your um, potting mix and you don't wanna crowd your plant roots. So, um, Choose the size of your pot according to your plant to be sure they have enough room to grow. So here's a planting that has um, a, low, a low box that has um, some mescaline in it. I like to grow my mescaline in a box with container, um, in a container with um, potting mix because I'm sure then that it, some little weeds won't come up in between the mescaline and get cut with the, with the, um, the leaves that I want to harvest some peas in a, in a 10 inch tall pot. Here's a 12 inch pot that has some um, green onions growing in it and a, a very low pot. This is an alpine strawberry that is growing in a fairly low pot, but not in a strawberry pot. Strawberry pots are not much good for strawberries. So you can read about that in Golden Gate Gardening. So um, here again is a slightly larger pot, like a 10 or 10 inch, 12 inch pot for chard. Um, you don't want to try to, but, but if you um, put them all in a large pot, then you will have wasted your, your potting mix because you don't need it. This is February, the chard is growing very nicely. And the, um, on the plus side, well, on the negative side, things growing in a container are in a fairly severe soil environment. They will, they can dry out in the blink of an eye, you have to pay attention even in the winter, because if there's a dry season, they could be too dry. They also get cold faster. So you can, but you can move them to a, um, a warmer place. You can move them under an overhang, which is a really good place to grow crops in the colder season, um, where, where a house or some other structure is above them so that the falling cold air won't, won't strike them especially if it's a south facing overhang so that the sun can shine on them most of the day. And you can actually bring them indoors or you can move them from the shady part of the garden to a sunnier part. Here they are, here's some lettuce in five inch deep pots and they have been moved to a sunny part of the garden in February, give them a little bit more chance to have sunshine. So, um, that's, that's, I, I wanna thank you for attending my lecture today. And here are, here are some crops that were harvested for the secret season. That was, that was an overwintered um, runner bean that came up very early. That's magenta spring, which is a um, chenopodium, spinach relative and a, a cabbage, some carrots, some beets. And you can see that you can be having something to eat early in the spring, late in the spring late spring, early summer harvest. But I wanted to thank you for attending my presentation today. And whenever you garden, I wish you happy days amid your plants and lots of delicious harvests and flowers and bird song to accompany your gardening. Thank you. Oh, Pam, that was so fun. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, so much information. And I know Dan's here too. We were like completely geeking out right now. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask, we do have some questions and I'm sure Dan wants to say some things too, but, um, one thing that I was thinking is, you know, in a lot of times in the winter season, we encourage putting cover crops down to like sort of add nitrogen back in, into your soil and whatnot. If you, if you're continuing 
through yeah. the year with like, you know, what, what are we doing to our soil? Do we need to like, do we just need to keep adding compost or what are you doing there? Thank you. I, I left that part out. It probably happened about the time of the, of the power went out, but <laughs> yeah, you should have something on your soil in the winter. You should either have something growing on your soil or you should have some mulch on your soil. And if you wish, you can grow a cover crop, but because I garden all year, I don't use cover crops very often. I have a fairly, I have a really small garden and I um, gar use it all year, but I am careful to, uh, to add um, organic matter and or fertilizer twice a year. So I usually have garden um, something in the garden like secret season and then fall or spring and then winter. So each time that I add something, I will be digging in some organic matter, some um, amendment, not potting mix, but amendment into my garden. And I will be, if it's has enough fertility, I will just be adding that if it's a good fertilizer. But if it's uh, like a homemade fertilizer that doesn't have much nitrogen in it, no, that's not enough. You have to add some fertilizer too. Um, if you do grow a cover crop, um, fava beans are a good cover crop, but people make the mistake of letting them mature and eat the beans and then think that digging them in is going to help. But that will not help because by that time, the extra nitrogen that the bean provided has gone into you and not into the ground. So the time to dig in a cover crop is when it's only a few inches tall or to cut it and use it in, um, in compost. But yeah, mulch, grow something to cover the surface, use a cover crop, do something in the winter so that your, your soil is covered. Pam, hey, about, the, about the time the power went out, uh, we had a couple of questions about uh, um, open pollinated lettuces that you mentioned. And one question was to repeat the a source for those, but also if you could talk a little about the concept of open pollinated and why it's important. I will. Um, many, many crops that we plant are hybrids, which means that the parents have been carefully selected, both the male and the female parent has been carefully selected and is uniform. And when it crosses, all those plants that come up will be uniform and they will combine the best traits of each parent. However, you cannot save the seed because, not because it won't grow, it'll grow, but it'll, it'll break down into all the possible possibilities genetically. Open pollinated is, it's, it, they're probably hybrid too. I mean, they're probably mixed, mixed parentage, but they're stable. They're stabilized so that you can, um, if there's any variation in that planting, it will remain in the, um, in the offspring. So open pollinated has been pollinated by whoever passes by, whichever pollen lands on the plant will pollinate it. Um, but usually it's controlled in such a way that the, um, um, the plant is still a very nice plant. And recently, so, so one thing, two things have happened. One is that we have heirloom plants, which are open pollinated by definition because nobody knew how to create F1 hybrids. F1 is the, is the first filial generation and that's what these hybrids are called. So no one knew how to do it. So the open pollinated, the, high, the heirloom crops are all open pollinated. But recently breeders, independent breeders have started to create open pollinated plants that are um, modern. And so they're like modern hybrids. And some of the best, uh, in lots of different nurseries, lots of different nurseries and seed companies carry them. But um, I found that adaptive seeds or siskiyou seeds or true um, wild garden seeds are good, good sources for them. And they will sometimes tell you which breeder created them. And one of the reasons this is important is, well, I will grow a hybrid and I will grow a hybrid because it is the only thing I can do well with in a particular location because it is resistant to a disease and it's the only thing I can get is the hybrid that will resist that disease or because it is um, able to produce in a, my cool climate, I will go for a hybrid, but I will choose open pollinated whenever I can. And one of the reasons is that um, is, um, utility patents, which are now being put on a lot of plants and the, um, open, the new open pollinated movement is attempting to 
subvert that. Um, the um, utility patent makes it impossible to grow the seed legally. You can grow the seed, fine, but it's illegal to do it. And that's ridiculous. So um, these, these new open pollinated varieties that are being developed by breeders are patent free. And there's an, even an organization called Open Source Seeds, OSS, osseeds.org, which encourages people and popularizes some of these varieties. And I think that's just marvelous. And I'm hoping that more of that takes place in the future. So I will grow an open pollinated variety whenever I can. And I'll be happy with the variation as long as I like the results. Right, that's something we talk about in the summer when uh, we, we have to discuss uh, early girl tomatoes, right. uh, which are uh, a controlled uh, mm -hmm. hybrid tomato and how uh, dirty girl tomatoes uh, came about as an open pollinated alternative. Uh, so that's kind of fun. And the way uh, that it's developed is someone plants that early girl out in a large field. I don't have it, I can't do that. I, if I grow seed from early girl, and, and if I even if I planted my entire garden space in early girl, I would have maybe five, 10 plants. But I, and I can't and I can't select the best because there's so few. So right. someone has grown that out and grown it out and kept taking the best and kept taking the best and kept taking the best until they got dirty girl. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about potatoes and do, do you use only certified seed potatoes or do you get potatoes from the grocery store and plant them and have success? I get potatoes from a nursery. I buy um, seed potatoes. And the reason that I do that is that I don't want to introduce diseases. And people say, what about organic? And I say, well, organic, organic doesn't mean it doesn't have a disease. Plant, potatoes can carry diseases that affect only potatoes so that when you buy them, you can eat them, they won't hurt you. However, if you plant them, they could spread a disease into your garden. So I buy only, only certified disease-free potatoes and onions, onion sets and garlic sets also. Well, okay, so we've got some more questions, let's see. Um... Lots of compliments. Everybody's loving this. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, I mean, so when you're talking, just a couple, I, you did touch on uh, some pests, uh, a couple, you know, for raccoons and squirrels, are you saying that caging is the best thing for those too? Or do you have other recommendations for those larger vermin? <laughs> well, it really depends upon how much pressure that you get. In other words, pressure mm -hmm. is how many of your plants get eaten, mm. <laughs> right? I mean, if you can't grow anything, yes, a cage is a really good idea because then you can grow something and that makes the, all the difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, it's also very important to do everything you can to discourage these creatures. So um, my neighbors have an apple tree. I have an apple tree. I pick all my apples and I either eat them or if I can't eat them, I donate them. I'm, I follow the principle of highest use. And if I have extra of anything in my garden or anywhere else, I try to have it go to the highest use possible. Our neighbor's tree dropped fruit on the roof of their little shed and the rats were just eating and eating and eating up there. So don't let anything lie around and tra attract creatures. That's, that's ridiculous. Be careful of your bird feeders. If your bird feeders are dropping bird feed onto the ground, they will attract rats and the rats will attract snakes. <laughs> and all kinds of terrible things will come into your garden if you, if you um, attract them. So be very careful not to attract them. Um, you can put um, netting under your beds. Um, there's a new kind of, of um, cage now. There's digging rats that the, um, the um, sewer rats dig under your garden and eat your plants from the bottom. And you can put in uh, wire caging. There's a new one that's made of um, stainless steel. You probably carry it and get, a, get one that's a little bigger than your plant roots. So that it takes to freeze up a little bit more space or you can put wire mesh under, under your entire bed and like you, like you were trying to prevent gophers. So do everything you can to exclude. Don't feed 
don't feed raccoons. I talked to someone. Yeah. The other day who I have a neighbor that does that. Uh, raccoons, they're so cute. Yes, they're so yeah. cute. They're also dangerous wild animals and they will eat gardens. So yes, this is an ongoing struggle and it is a community-wide struggle. And you may have to have some unpleasant conversations with your neighbors. Mm -hmm because it, it, it's not something that you can and it's no longer legal to to pack up the the raccoon or the or whatever it is you've caught in a um in a kind cage and take it out to the wild because there's no more wild to take them to it's no longer legal to do that so yeah there's a lot to be said about those creatures and a lot of it is in golden gate garden um do you there was a question on climate change and, and the impact that you're seeing on, on your plants. I mean, is that uh, more, I guess I would, I, the way that I think of it, maybe that's more of a reason to take advantage of the secret season because things are shifting so much. And so we're sort of rethinking the calendar in a way. Does, well, you, is might that... as well. you might as well take advantage, but at the same time, mm -hmm really aware that this is not in our favor. We are frogs, mm -hmm. warm water, and we are not noticing. And we think, oh, this is very nice. Yes, it's very nice. <laughs> as my, as my, my sweet daughter said, living in Minnesota, oh, maybe I'll be able to grow oranges. Well, in her favor, she said that about five years ago. She didn't say that now. Um, well, that's nice. But on the other hand, you know, we do live on an oceanfront property that it, where the ocean is rising. And we are dealing with a lot of, of um, weather that is not what we want. We're seeing a lot more torrential rain. We're seeing a lot more storms. And my apple tree bloomed two years ago in, in August, September, October. It bloomed better than it usually blooms in April. And it yeah. set fruit and that fruit tried to ripen. And oh Lord, I cut it all off. And, oh. and it bloomed again in April and made a crop, but I was very unhappy. And I also noticed that same spring, the, um, the flowering cherries on the streets did not have flowers. Some of them never leafed out. Some of them never bloomed and never leafed out. And so there's going to be consequence. Roses are a temp temperate season plant. And, and particularly the, uh, the torrential rains uh, should make us all think about making sure the soil is covered, especially if you're on a slope of any kind. Right. Um, I, I had flooding waters racing through my mm -hmm. back 40 uh, this year for the first time in memory from that big rain mm -hmm. and made me think about how to make the soil more water retention friendly. I don't want any water running off of my property. I want it to stay there. Soak in. Yep. Well, this has been really amazing. We're a little bit over an hour now. I know there still is some questions. If we didn't address your question, feel free to email me. I'm happy to pass them along to Pam or Dan. Um, I'm really happy to have this the both of you here this has been an incredible presentation and a lot of information um like i said the recording will be available on tuesday with its gap <laughs> oh yeah we talked through the gap it's cool it's okay. fine oh, um yes. yeah so but it'll be available on our youtube channel if you subscribe to our YouTube, then you'll get a notification when it's up. And then also it'll be on our website under the learn tab and gardening videos. Pam, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Like I said, this has been awesome. Uh, it's a nice day out today. So I hope everybody gets outside a bit and um, you know, have fun in your garden. I'm thank about you so to much. I wanted to say one last thing and that is that if you have questions that didn't get answered, and you should look at them up in Golden Gate Gardening, but you can also go onto my website and ask a question through my website. You can send a letter to the Chronicle and ask me a question in the Chronicle, or you can go to the website, find the blog link, link to the blog and ask and put a comment in the blog. Probably the, the website will get me a more direct answer. I will, I will answer questions in the, in the blog, but not as quickly and not as late, yeah, it'll be better. But you can That's ask awesome. 
And I'm delighted you all came. I'm really sorry I can't do it in person. I'd love to see your faces, all of you, and um, happy gardening. Thanks again, Pam. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.